a different meeting here and I couldn't be there too. So I'm very sorry. I, I'm, I wish I would be there. Uh, anyway, I'm going to tell you about new results in the theory of nuclear fission. And here I want to mention my collaborators, those who is Roman Fonts, Xi Jin, Piotr Magersi, Kenneth Roach, Nicolas Schon, Yonel Setko have been directly involved in this work. The other two, Michael Force and Rodrigo Navarro Perez, helped in creating the new functional which I'll be using in this presentation. So let me get into the meat. Nuclear fission, it's unquestionably one of the most challenging quantum many problems in theoretical physics. Superconductivity needed less than 50 years to reach a microscopic understanding from 1911 to 1957. Nuclear fission, it's almost 80 years old. If we don't, uh, I forgot to mention, it was discovered in 1938. It was also the impetus for funding big science in the second part of the uh, second century and basically changed everybody's life on this planet. It's important for fund fundamental nuclear theory, origin of elements, and lots of applications. What's important, you see, uh, that recently two developments have radically changed our prospects of attaining a microscopic description of nuclear fission. So this presentation, you see, before I go there, you see, it's a perfect illustration of Derry Berry's suggestion. Never be afraid to try something new. Remember that amateurs build the Ark and professionals build the Titanic. I definitely could not call myself a high efficient or high performance computing expert at the time when this project started around late 2006. And that time, nuclear fission looked to me like a very good problem to try, but I was unaware of how complex it really is. Now I know a bit more. But then again, as Sidney Brenner said, I'm a strong believer that ignorance is important in science. And if you know too much, you start seeing why things won't work. That's why it's important to change your field to collect more ignorance. So, the, okay, my slides. So now to tell you about this uh, new developments. So in theory was the formulation of the local extension of the density functional theory in the spirit of local density approximation, which was due to Kohn and Sham. And this is called superfluid local density approximation. That's the acronym SLDA. It was needed to validate and verify this theory against a large set of theoretical and experimental data. And I'll explain you why you need to validate against theory. And also in high performance computing, lately we saw the emergence of very powerful compute, uh, computers, which allow us to implement the non-trivial mathematical complexity of TDSLDA, and uh, in particular use tens of thousands of GPUs. Uh, to simply exemplify, the SLDA needs to solve from tens to up to a million coupled complex nonlinear time-dependent three-dimensional partial differential equation. This is the magnitude of the numerical problem we are dealing with. So a little bit about uh, nuclear fission. Here, it's, you have a graph, which is a qualitative description of how the energy of the nucleus changes when you change shape. In the ground state, it's almost spherical. You start elongating it and it becomes like a peanut. And then it reaches this point, which is called saddle point. And then if you follow further, you extend it further, you obtain a scission when it separates into fragments. Now, this process is highly non-trivial. It takes from here to here about 10 to minus 15, uh, 10 to minus 20 seconds or so. From here, from the ground state to the saddle point, takes a very long time, 10 to minus 15 seconds. And this is not all of it, because after this, the two fragments are separated. They coulomb repel each other. And uh, after that, they emit neutrons after in, in this time, 10 to minus 14 seconds. After that, they emit gammas up to seconds. And after that follows beta decay, basically up to the lifetime of the universe. So the, the whole time scale of the fission, pro fission process, you know, from 10 to minus 21, basically to infinity. 
Now, why this energy has this behavior? It's a very simple uh, qualitative description of this. At the beginning, when you deform the nucleus from the sphere to something which is not a sphere, you have to maintain the volume because the system is saturating, but you increase the surface. So nucleus uh, surface tension in leads to an increase of the energy of the nucleus. But later on, the charges, because the nucleus is charged, they become on average further apart and the Coulomb energy becomes less and less and this starts dominating and the energy goes down. So this is the general behavior. The, the, the change of behavior, it's a little bit more complicated because nuclei are made of fermions, there are single particle levels, and once you start deforming, starting from a spherical shape, the uh, different magnetic states start moving in different directions. For example, when you elongate, states with large magnetic moments go up, with small magnetic moments go down. Fermi surface will be somewhere here. At the same time, each of these levels is double degenerate. Now, if you keep deforming and you don't relocate nucleons from one level to another, the Fermi sphere in the ground state, it will become more and more elongate, uh, more and more oblate like a pizza, while the nucleus becomes more like a cucumber. So at one point, this level cross, and you need to relocate two nucleons from this level to the other level it goes down, and at the same time you have to do two of them. The only uh, process which is very effective of this is tearing, which allows states with uh, uh, in time reverse orbits to, to, to jump at the same time. Pairing, therefore, it's a very important uh, element in fission. So uh, I, I'll exemplify this later. Uh, so I'm going to skip this and tell you here, for example, why you see how this problem appears. So here on the left, you have an example which is fictitious, which was uh, studied in 1980s by Negele. He artificially increased the charge of the protons, and in that case, sulfur-32 was able to fission. But see what's happening. Sulfur-32 is basically spherical in the ground state. But if you look at what kind of uh, magnetic states you have, angular momentum, so LZ if you want, are occupied, you'll find five of them with one half, three, uh, two of them with three halves, and one with five halves. When it separates into fragments, you'll find only one half and three halves. So you see here you have the five half, and here you don't, and here you have five of five halves, and here you have six of them. So you have a strong redistribution of single particle level going from here to here. It's a little bit even more complicated than that. If you do a realistic calculation of the potential energy surface of a fishing and nucleus, you'll see that at the beginning, it follows this curve in the right panel, which is blue here, and the nucleus from here to here, it's actually symmetric. But if you continue deforming, so elongating further, it becomes triaxial. And after that, it becomes uh, axially symmetric again, but it loses the left-right symmetry. Because in fission, most of the time, the two fragments are not equal. One of them is heavier, one of them is lighter. So this is, this is what you uh, think kind of things you have to overcome in a description of fission. So now... Let's go further and see how we can proceed with this process. Uh, so I'll tell you my, my theoretical tools, which I mentioned before, is density functional theory, which was created in 1964. There are monographs already, many of them. I have a picture of one of them. And this has been extended in many directions, in particular for time-dependent phenomena. And already there are many for monographs in that, in, in that, uh, for covering that aspects too. The problem with this is the following. This density functional theory was developed mostly for normal system, not for superfluid one. Nuclei are superfluid. And as I often say, not everyone is normal, and you need an extension to DFT of DFT to superfluid system and time-dependent phenomena. And this is what has been created uh, relatively recently. So now to tell you a little bit about density functional. There are two alternative ways of describing a many-body system. You can solve the Schrödinger equation like this, which means that you have to find the wave function which depends on tree and coordinates, so forget at the moment about the spin. 
and then you'll, de you'll be able to determine the energy of the system if you know the kinetic energy, two particle interaction, three particle, and maybe some external fields. Now, obviously, if you know the wave function, you can easily determine the density. What Conant Homberg proved, at actually, it was something absolutely um, exceptional and totally unexpected, that if you know the wave function, many body wave function, you very easily can construct the density distribution of the fermions. But if you know the density distribution of the fermions, you also can go all the way back and create the many body wave function. And this is a function of three variables. This is a function of three and variable. It looks like a mathematical impossibility, but this is a mathematical exact result. There is a one-to-one -one correspondence between this object and this object. Now, if you have this object which is fully determined by the density, you plug it into the expectation energy of the entire many-body system. And since this is a functional of function, wave function, it's a function of density alone, the total energy becomes a functional of the density alone, too. So a consequence of this is the fact that there exists a functional, which it's a function of density alone, and it's universal in the following sense. You can add up a one-body potential, external potential, and this functional won't change. The problem is that we don't have recipes to construct them, so we have to to guess it, to, to construct approximate schemes, and so on. But we're dealing with something similar in the nuclear problem. We don't know the interaction yet. It has to be derived from QCD and following various approximations. So in a way, deriving the functional and deriving the interaction, it's uh, are similar processes. But you have to keep in mind that this, if you know the interaction, it's mathematically equivalent to this problem. Now, uh, it's important that if you have a functional, a density functional, to make sure that it correctly describes nature, because otherwise it's, uh, it's useless. But at the same time, you have to require the following, that it reproduces the Schrodinger, Schrodinger picture too. So it faithfully reproduces the theory. And this is independent of the fact that it reproduces the, the nature. So you have to prove the second point and the first one too. These two descriptions have to be identical. Fortunately, there exists a system where this is possible to do, and this is the unitary Fermi gas, and they'll go very fast through this. I believe Gabriel described this probably. In that case, you can show that dimensional arguments, renormalizability, Galilean invariance, and symmetry determine fully the functional form. And what you have to determine is only three dimensional constant, this constant, alpha, beta and gamma. And uh, the, 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 these constants are determined if you do a quantum Monte Carlo study of this homogeneous system. So you do a quantum Monte Carlo of an infinite homogeneous system, determine these constants alpha, beta, and gamma, and after that you can use it to predict properties of other systems. And here it's an example. And there is probably close to 100 by now. You calculate the ground state energies of system, for example, seven fermion up and spin up and four down, or eight up and eight down, or 15 up and 14 down. And then you compare what you obtained in Quantum Monte Carlo is this column, and here you have what the SLDA gives you. And here there are two different things, too. On, on the right side, you have system because they, they are not always superfluid. These are superfluid, but these systems are not. But in all cases, you see that the agreement is very good. Typically, the disagreement between the two is due to the inaccuracies of the quantum Monte Carlo results. So we can proceed with this picture further. For example, what it helped us to do at one point to show that the result which was published in Nature quite a long, uh, some four years ago, where people predicted that they observed the heavy soliton, using SLDA, we proved that actually that was a vortex ring. And that was confirmed later on by experiment. Um, so now, when you go to a time-dependent phenomenon, you have to do a little bit uh, more because things move. So you have to introduce currents. And typically, Galilean invariance determines the dependence of the functional on currents. And also, you might have external probes. And now, the, fun the, the good thing about density functional theory is that no matter what is this external probe, this part of the functional doesn't change. 
Now, you minimize the variation of the stationary um, variation principle for the, for the time-dependent problem, and you end up with a system of equation which looks like this, which is almost, uh, at the first sight, identical with bogoliubov degen equations. Here you have the Hartifov Hamiltonian. Here you have the pairing field, which is local. You might have an external pairing field or an external potential and the chemical potential. And you have U's and V's, which are the Bogolyubov quasi-particle amplitudes, and they depend on time and position, three-dimensional. And this I typically belongs to a continuum. So here it's the way the complexity of the problem relies, that this is an infinite number of partial differential equations. Knowing this U and Vs, you determine the density of the system, which determines the Hamiltonian and the pairing field, and this is how you solve the problem. So now I'll proceed with the SSC showing you how this is implemented in practice in a nuclear case. In that case, you have spin up and spin down, so you have components U with spin up and spin down, and the equation for one quasi-particle wave function looks like that. You see the Hamiltonian has a block structure. This is the typical, what you'd call, mean field or Hartree fork, and this is the pairing field. But even though this looks like mean field, in principle, this is the exact description. So the number of equations, as I said, could reach a million. And as I'll show you later, you see in case of nuclei, it, it reaches up to half a million. Now, the computational tool which I'm using, it's supercomputers, and I give you an example of one, which is Titan which was uh, ranked uh, until recent number three, now it was downgraded to number four. And this has a rank, uh, top speed, at least theoretical, at 27 petaflops. It contains about, uh, it contains about 18,000 GPUs and about 300,000 CPUs. But the remarkable thing is that even though the CPUs, it's about almost 20 times uh, the number of CPUs larger than the number of GPUs, the GPUs provide 90% of the entire speed. A single GPU is equivalent to 134 CPUs. So this is the reason how you are going to win. Now, I'm going to show you how we did this in nuclear physics. We use several functionals because, unfortunately, we don't know the exact one, so we construct it phenomenologically. And we put the nucleus, which we study, in a big box, which is 60 Fermi on one side and 30 Fermi on the other two sides. A nucleus, typically, it's about 12 Fermi or 15 Fermi, you see, across in all directions. So there is lots of space to see the tails of the wave function. We have a momentum cutoff, which is pretty high. We use a very high accuracy uh, integration scheme of the time uh, time uh, differential equations. We use uh, Fourier transform in order to calculate derivatives and basically retain all its machine precision. We use a very small time step, and in a simulation, we have typically about 100,000 and sometimes close to a million time steps. And uh, the simulation takes about 2.5 time steps per second. The number of equations which you solve for nuclei, you see it's close to half a million. And the simulation on this computer using something like 1,700 GPUs runs between 4 and 12 hours, depending on the system we are looking at. So now, let me exemplify fission of uh, plutonium-240. Here I have uh, actually pictures. On the right, it depicts the density of the nucleus. Here's the initial state. So what do we do? We don't do complete things. So I'm going to go back to... Uh, to, to a picture which I showed you at the beginning, this one. We don't start at the ground stage. So typically you have a nucleus like plutonium-239 is bombarded with neutrons. You create plutonium-240 and you start here and then the system, you create a compound nucleus which evolves very, very, very slowly until it attains this point. So basically from here to here you have a thermal evolution, but from here to here you have a very fast evolution which is non-equilibrium. So we start in about this region and follow the system up to somewhere here where the fragments are well separated. So there, you see, so I'm going back, you see, to that uh, diagram. What you see here is the density of the system close to the saddle point, and you follow it in time, and you see here the formation of the two 
fission fragments. The upper part showed the density of the neutrons, the lower part showed the density of the proton, and, the, and on the right you see the pairing field. What you see in both, especially in the left column, you see lots of fluctuations. For example, here the magnitude of the pairing field varies quite a lot. So uh, I have a movie and probably I'm going to run this very quickly because I don't want to to keep you. And we have three different simulations and you see here how the density of the system evolves. And one system already fission, the others took a little bit longer. Okay, so, but eventually they'll fission too. Okay, so you see the fission here. Now, uh, what was surprising for us, we picked at random one of the more than 300 uh, functions which exist in literature. And if we look at a few properties of our results, the uh, features that we observe, the kinetic energy of the fragments. So once they separate into fragments, the two uh, nuclei, the two fission products, repel each other, and they attain a final kinetic energy at infinity. And that is measured or evaluated. And uh, what evaluation shows for the condition we studied, you have something like 177 MeVs. What we obtain, about 180, which, so which is a precision better than 2% or so, which is simply surprising. At the same time, we know the masses of the fragment. There is a light fragment and there is a heavy fragment. Here you have only the properties of the light fragment because the, once you know the light, you know the mass of the, the heavy one. So the light, it's 100. The heavy, it'll be 140. And you know the number of neutrons and you know the number of protons. And you see there is a very, very close correspondence between what we computed and what was observed. At the same time, we also observe that the fragments don't emerge in their ground states, but they're excited. And this is the reason, because this is due to the fact that they have to evolve in time, and this process is highly non-adiabatic, it's non-equilibrium. And the other surprising thing is that the light fragment contains more excitation energy than the heavy fragment. If you'll have an equilibrium process, then the excitation energy will be proportional to the atomic number of each fragment, which definitely is not the case. You'd expect this one to be to, to have more energy than this one. And if you divide by, uh, if you calculate the temperature, you'll obtain equal temperature. Actually, what this shows, that the light fragment is hot, while the cold fragment is light, it's cold. The other thing which, which surprised us in this simulation was the fact that the fission, it took a very long time and uh, much longer than expected, about 10 times longer. And um, we try to understand that. And the easiest way is to show you a demo which we use at the University of Washington in order to illustrate the 2D analog of the through the conduction, uh, electron conduction model in electrons. On the left, you'll see electrons in quotes, which go down the slope, which is generated by the quote-unquote electric field, and there, is, there are no ions, so it's a free sliding down the potential surface, while here you see pins which play the role of the ion, and you have elastic collisions between the electrons and the pins. So you don't have any dissipation here, but look at the result. So we tilt the system, so we apply the electric field. No electric field, it goes very fast, this goes very slow. This is exactly what happens in the case of nuclei. Because of those cross, uh, the level crossings which I mentioned earlier, so I'm going back to the slide which I showed earlier. Here, the energy potential surface has all kinds of bumps and valleys, and they play the role of the ions in, uh, uh, in, in the case of the electrons. And the, the system has to bounce off those pins, quote unquote, and it takes much longer to fission. Now, after this first result, which we obtained almost two years ago, we proceeded further and uh, did the following. Is pairing really important in all this process, like I was trying to convince you? And what we did, we artificially increased the strength of the pairing from about 1 MeV to about 3 MeV. And we follow the fission. Here it's with the normal pairing, the system fission, and about 14,000 Fermi over C. This is about uh, 10 to minus 19 seconds. And here, the system fission with the enhanced pairing 10 times faster. And this, the, in, in this case, you are dealing basically with an ideal 
superfluid hydrodynamic behavior of the nucleus. Here it's not quite. You see the, the pairing field fluctuates a lot. Here the pairing field and the phase. Here you have the phase on the right, and here's the magnitude of the pairing field. It's basically constant throughout, throughout the entire system from the beginning to the end. So pairing indeed plays a very important role. In, in this. Now, I'm going to exemplify with a few other examples. Uh, we studied later. We constructed a new nuclear density functional, which we call SEAL LL1. This is for Seattle and Lawrence Livermore, you see, which combines the authors which contributed to this. It's, it's phenomenological, like many others, like most of the functions we have in nuclear physics, but it has a very low error in describing basically all known, even, even nuclei recently measured. I mean, all of them known so far. And the error is about 1.5 MeV, and you have to keep in mind that the total binding energy of this nuclei is about, for heavy nuclei, about 2,000. So the error here is sub-percent level. And it depends on a very small number of parameters, which I describe here, and I'll simply leave it here, you see, and not go into more details than this. So now, it, it has a very good description of single particle properties. They can be determined in an experiment, and then also from this. And this is one of the, the, the best agreements between theory and experiment, which we have so far. Now, what do we do? We construct a potential energy surface. So we take the nucleus and use two different functionals. One seal, the one we constructed, and another one is traditionally used in the fission study, aka SKM star, and deform the nucleus by hand. So we impose constraint. So we impose a quadrupole constraint, which makes the nucleus look more and more like a peanut. But at the same time, we impose an octopole constraint, which allows for left-right asymmetry. As I mentioned before, the fission products are not necessarily equal. Most of the time, are equal. There is a heavy and there is a light one. So now, what you see here, you see here blue region. This is very low energy. So this is the ground state of the system. And if you start elongating the system, the system stays, stays axially symmetric. You don't have any octopole asymmetry. And you go over a barrier, and you have a so-called second fission isomer. The system is still axially symmetric. But if you want to follow the valley, you'll have to go into the asymmetric uh, direction where you have left-right asymmetry, and you have a saddle point. And classically, if you'll have a classical system, it will follow this trajectory, which is shown with dashed white line. So what we did, because we are dealing with a quantum system, we chose different initial conditions like this or like this here with red and, and the green dots or green dots on this side, and asked the question what the system would do. And uh, here's the result. Uh, here you have three different projections of this three-dimensional potential energy surface, so you can see how it looks like. So this will be the, the ground state here, this will be the sufficient isomer, and here is the saddle. But if you look from above a control plot, this is how it looks there. So now, if we look at this, we start in from differential conditions, and surprisingly, all of these trajectories converge to one. The same thing seems to be if we start much further away. We calculated the total kinetic energy of these fragments. So starting from here, the system splits in two fragments. They're not totally identical, but they're very close. And the total kinetic energy is about 178. At the same time, we also estimated at the end the excitation energy of the fragment. That excitation energy of each fragment eventually is going to be released in form of neutron emission and gamma rays. So if you add the two together, you obtain the total energy released in fission process, which is about 200 MeV or so. And irrespective of the fact that we started here, we started there, we obtain about the same energy in both cases. Now, this energy, it's much, much larger than the energy released in a chemical re reaction, which will be of the order of one electron volt. This is a mega electron volt, and they have uh, 200 of them, so you have about eight orders of magnitude, many more, much more energy released in this, in this process. We changed the functional because we don't know it exactly which one is the exact one. And 
uh, we did the same thing, and uh, surely enough, we obtained more or less the same type of behavior, subtle difference in initial conditions. But we finished at about the same final stage, and if you compare here the final total uh, energy release, it's 206, here it was 211, so it's a difference at about 2% or so. What this system doesn't give, typically the fission fragments are not of one kind. In a fission process, you obtain something like 700 different isotopes. We obtain only average properties. And uh, we obtain the average prop uh, number of neutrons of the heavy fragment, about 84. The uh, average number of the neutrons in the light fragment, about 62. The charge of the heavy fragment, 53. And the charge of the light fragment, 40. Now, the interesting thing about this heavy fragment is that it emerges almost spherical. So let me show you, see, in the movies, which I showed you earlier, you see, this is the heavy fragment. You see, this is the heavy fragment. It's almost spherical, while the light fragment is this one. It's very deformed. The ratio of this axis to this axis is about 3 to 2. And the nuclei in their ground states are not that deformed. And that energy eventually is converted into excitation energy, which you can measure with uh, thermodynamically with temperature. So you either can say what's the kinetic energy or the excitation energy of the fragment, but temperature probably it's a better measure. You see the temperature of the heavy fragment is 1.15, light one is 1.2 in this simulation. And, in, and here you also obtain the same thing. You see that the heavy fragment, it's relatively cold, while the, the heavy fragment is it's, uh, hotter, warmer, if you want. There is another thing on, on this uh, diagram, if you look carefully. There is a trajectory which starts here, and it goes over here. And if you look uh, on the left, uh, the vertical axis, you'll see that Q3 is basically zero. This corresponds to symmetric fission, which is a very rare process. And in that case, if you want to characterize, you'll see the kinetic energy release is about 150 MeV as opposed to about 175 here. But if you add together the excitation and the kinetic energies, you obtain basically the same number here and here. There is also another trajectory here. We started well outside the saddle point, but the system being quantum doesn't necessarily go always to the right, sometimes goes to the left, and it ended up in the first fission isomer. To emerge from here, it will take a very long time, and we decided not to follow that, because that will be very costly. So let me try to go a little bit further and show you another property of this, uh, of this fission process. You can calculate the kinetic energy which you have, which you call the collective kinetic energy. So for example, you can take all fermions, calculate the total flow of the system. In the ground state, you don't have any flow. But if you have a system oscillating or doing any other thing, you'll have a flow. You'll, and this, this is this quantity which you calculate in this way. And you can estimate also the total kinetic energy, which is in that type of motion, which you call collective flow. And here we follow the, the collective flow energy as a function of time. From the top of the barrier to the decision point, there is a difference at about 20 MeV. So if you expect that you have an adiabatic process, which was assumed for a very long time, basically until this work emerged here, that nuclei follow an adiabatic surface. Actually, there were a few other papers which didn't follow this, but that was never proven that this is, um, this is what's happening. Uh, you'll see that, uh, you'll assume that all the inertial excitation energy, so let me go back to the diagram which I had at the beginning, Okay, so I have to go a long way. Sorry about this. You see, you start somewhere here, so you have this potential energy. When you come to scission, you'll have this different energy, difference in potential delta V, which is about 20 MeV. And here you expect, if you have an adiabatic evolution, that you'll follow this line. And here, all this energy, it will be converted into the kinetic energy of the fragments, which later on are going to move even faster due to the Coulomb repulsion. But this is what's happening because you're dealing with fermions in a 
in a container whose walls are moving. So these electrons collide with the walls. At the same time, there is an opening from left to right, and they can go from left to right. And this energy is converted into internal energy. Actually, this type of mechanism was first inferred by Fermi, who uh, tried to generate a mechanism for cosmic ray um, um, uh, energies, why they, they, uh, they are so big. And it was also collision of particles with uh, moving clouds. What we see here that the collective flow is basically negligible. It's always about half an MeV on average until you need scission. And when you need, uh, uh, come at scission, that the energy increases and that becomes the total kinetic energy of the, of the, uh, of the system. Interesting, they obtained the same thing, the same behavior, when we had a very large pairing gap. It was exactly the same behavior. Um, I'm not going to go into more details. I'm going to go into a summary. And the first conclusion, while pairing is not the engine driving the fission, pairing provides the essential lubricant without which the evolution may arrive quickly to a screeching halt. If I turn off pairing completely, nuclear won't fission. And it's very easy to do that. The uh, TDSLDA offers new insights into nuclear processes in quantities which are either not easy or impossible to obtain or measure in the laboratory. For example, fission fragment, excitation engine, angular momentum distribution of those. That's very important because this angular momentum is carried by neutrons and gammas, and you want to predict how many of those are going to be uh, produced. Uh, also, fission is very important to clarify the origin of elements. All elements... Uh, heavier than iron are created in supernova explosion or black hole, um, um, neutron star mergers or black hole neutron star mergers and things like that. And also there are other nuclear reactions which can be described in this way. And I believe Piotr gave a talk telling you about the unexpected role of pairing in nuclear and heavy ion collisions. This uh, um, new functional approach offers you an unprecedented opportunity to test nuclear energy density functional for large amplitude motion and non-equilibrium phenomena in regions where the collective degrees of freedom were not really tested before at a microscopic level. The quality of the agreement to the experimental is surprisingly good, especially taking into account that we made no effort to fit the results. We simply took something standard and applied it. Okay. Uh, this, uh, the fact that we predict long uh, saddle to season time must, must be very important because you'd be able to create nuclear system, and here it's a typo. I shouldn't have said, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said Z100, but Z200. You can imagine that you have two heavy nuclei, like two plutoniums, colliding, and they can stick to each other for a very long time, and you have a very long-lived nuclear, nuclear system with a charge close to 200. And this could be a mechanism to create a nuclear system with charges well beyond the super-heavy elements. Now, uh, I won't go into mass, charge, distribution, and so on, because that's a long discussion. Simply to leave this you see, uh, for you to look. Uh, what SLDA was able to do so far, which was the first microscopic description of uh, structure and creation and decay of quantized vortices in Fermi superfluids. It was the first microscopic description of the incipient phases of quantum turbulence, which I believe Gabriel talked about today. And it showed the crossing and recombination, which is at the root of the quantum turbulence in, in the fermion system, in, in superfluid system. It it led to a correct identification of domain walls, quantized vortices, dynamics, and decay. Uh, we studied the microscopic structure of vortices in neutron matter and the interaction with, uh, the interaction with uh, nuclei and the pinning mechanism. Uh, also, we described microscopically the Coulomb excitation of uh, nuclei with relativistic probes like uranium or 
good uranium collision. And obviously, it was nuclear collision, uh, nuclear uh, in, induced fission, and collision of heavy nuclei. With this, I think I'm done, and I'm open for discussions, for questions.